So if you have a Bible with you, please open the book of John, chapter 1, verse 35 to 42. Okay. Here's the word of God. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Luke, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four, four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought, brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Amen. So in today's scripture, you'll find that Jesus' first word recorded in the Gospel of John was not a statement or a sermon, but interestingly, it was a question. So Jesus, speaking to humanity, recorded in John's Gospel, begins with this question. What do you want? Human, what do you want? What do you really want in your life? How you answer this question can totally change your life. It, it can either liberate you and have this exhilarating experience like flying into the sky and touching the face of God and having shalom in your heart. Or you'll find yourself going down deeper and deeper into the darkness, living in this never-ending confusion and despair, never really knowing what do I want. In my life, ending up in a place called Shiwal. Before we dive in, I wanted to notice that just before Jesus asked this life-changing question to these two people who are following Jesus, what caught my eyes is these two words written in verse 38. Uh, say with me, turn and saw. Turn and saw. Can you say with me, turn and saw? <laughs> okay, that's good. All right. So verse 8, it says, Jesus turned and saw them following, and then asked, what do you want? Now I want to think about this. When this happened, when this scene was taking place, you know, it started with Jesus walking his way, right? which means he could have walked straight without looking back. Jesus could not, could not have been given his eyes to those two people who were following him, he simply ignored them. But that wasn't the case. Jesus turned around, right, intentionally, I believe, and gave his eyes on them. And the story goes further. There comes a conversation. And as the story goes, by, right, you know, these they even stayed together, which tells a clear message that God cares about us. God sees us. God hears us. God wants us to be with him. He wants to be with us. Now, God turns and sees you. As the scripture goes, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So as you are here today to draw near to God, the scripture reminds us it's one thing that God sees you right now. His eyes are on you. I want you to feel it. God's eyes are on you. It's one of you. And God is telling you, perhaps whispering in your heart, son, daughter, I'm so glad you're here. I love you, I care about you. But then he asked this question to each one of us. So what do you want? Why are you here today? What are you seeking? What are you looking for? You have to understand that Jesus asked this question, not because he didn't know the answer. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity God, he, he knows about everything, right? He, his eyes can penet penetrate your heart. He knows you more than you know yourself because he created you. This Jesus' first question to humanity in John's Gospel echoes 
God's God the Father first question to the first human being in the book of Genesis. God asked, you know, do you know what was God's first question to human beings, the first human? It was, where are you? <laughs> where are you, Adam? As if he didn't know where he was, right? Just like that, Jesus asked this question to his two disciples. You know, not because he, he didn't know the answer, but he wanted to give them a chance, give us a chance to have some momentum, to have awareness, to understand what's really in our hearts. And he wanted to say it aloud in some way, why we are here today, why we are following Jesus. What do I really want when following Jesus? Why am I really here in a God-worshiping place? Is it really God? Why am I here? Or something else? Say, counterfeit God. Meaning, anything that seems so central and essential to your life, that should you lose it, your life will be, you know, feel hardly worth living. Something like your success, your career, your money, your health, your family, your happiness, your pride, all matters. They are not as worthy to worship or follow. So is that why you follow Jesus? Is Jesus the only reason and purpose you follow him? So let's say you put a magnifying glass on your heart. What would you be able to find? The truth is sometimes, if not always, it's hard to know what's really in our heart. Sometimes knowing precisely what's in our heart is not simple. How many times, how often times we say, I don't know what my heart is. I don't know where my heart is. So one good way to find out what's really in your heart is to, to, is to look at how you pray. Because a prayer reveals our deepest desires and wants. It's like a litmus test that discloses our ultimate concern. So think about your prayer the contents of your prayer, what do you pray for, what drives you to pray, what do you expect to get from your prayers? Is my prayer all about my needs, my necessities, and my well-being? Or do I offer a prayer for God's concerns, God's name, God's glory, and God's honor? Is my prayer really resonating with God's prayers? When we look at the godly people in the Bible, will find that their prayer always had something to do with God's own heart. When God is exalted, it makes their hearts happy and satisfied. They offer prayer, praising God and worshiping God. When they, you know, their hearts disheartened once God is dishonored because they had passion for God, they had zeal for God's concerns. For instance, think about David. David. Once he discovered that this giant defied God's army, which means this giant defied God's name and his glory. Hearing this, David became infuriated. He must have thought, how could this be? How dare this pagan dishonor my God? So this young man stood before King Saul, pleading to send him off to the battlefield because he could never put up with a person who humiliates his living God. But to Saul's eyes, he was just a little kid, right? It seems too cruel to, to mess the fight with this giant fighting machine with this little boy. So Saul became reserved. But David insisted. He did not back away. He said, your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he had defied the armies of the living God. So being persuaded by his conviction, Saul finally gave permission off to go. Approaching Goliath, David said, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you in my hand. The scripture describes David in this way, a man after God, God's own heart. In other words, he was a man who cared about God's heart, God's glory, God's name, and God's concerns. So these days, we pray for our church. We've been praying hard you know, for our church, and certainly we need to pray for more of the, you know, more for the church. And I do hear concerns about the state of our church, and even we are saddened by what's going on in our community. 
But I want everyone to look into our hearts to examine where that sadness really comes from. Is our grieving and sadness simply due to the numbers declining, churches being empty, church doors being closed, and, and because it's not like the old days, the glorious days. And if our minds are busier, have better strategies and cultural intelligence so that we can better engage with the culture and the society by which we expect to increase the membership, increase the church offerings. And let me tell you, this is not really the church. This is business. And the church is not a business. It's the body of Christ. The living organism that came to life by the breath of God that was purchased by the blood of Jesus. We Christians are part of this living organism of Christ's body, meaning if the church is suffering today, and yes, we are, right? Do we really have that sense of pain, hurt, grief? Because the grief, pain, and hurt must be in God's heart right now. Do we have that resentment? Not because of declining numbers, because of God's name being mocked in some ways. If we can have revival today, I believe the true revival, what we need, is not the number growing and better engaging with the world, but our hearts burning for it. God's concerns become our really concerns. God's pain become our pains. We feel the heart of God, you know, and we pray for God's church, for God's glory and God's honor, and really to stand up for Jesus, just like this David. To worldly eyes, it seems nothing, right? It's just a little boy. But his heart, something stirred his heart because he cared for God's heart. He cared for God's name. He could not put up with somebody who defiles, who defies from God. Unless we have that revival in our church, in our hearts, in Christian heart, what revival should we really talk about? Numbers? <laughs> Money? It's not business. So what do you want to this God's inquiry? How would you answer today? What do you want? When these two disciples heard this question, they said, Rabbi, where do you stay? It's an interesting statement because here, stay, the word, in Greek is meno. Can we say with me, meno? Meno? Meno. Okay, thank you. It's just, I got three people there. <laughs> okay, let's say it again, meno. All right, thank you, thank you. So it's the same word we find in John uh, chapter 15. You know, probably you all know, abide in me. You know, so that you can bear fruits apart from me, you bear nothing. Here, the word abide in Greek is also meno. So it represents a life union connection between Jesus and the disciples. So when they ask Jesus, where do you stay? Where do you meno? You know, it's, a, it's a question more like they're asking uh, Jesus' spiritual root rather than simply an uh, address. It's like, I see that you have something special, teacher. You know, that's what John the Baptist said, and that's what other people say about you. But are you really the source of life? Are you really the one? Are you really the one that you're seeking and looking for? Nothing can replace you. To this critical mind, Jesus' answer was quick and simple. He said, come and see. So fast forward, they accepted Jesus' invitation. They stayed. They met on with Jesus. And they figured out who Jesus really was. As we find in verse 41, it says, we have found the Messiah, the Savior. So my friends, what do you want? What do we really need? If we are missing one thing today in our hearts, in our lives, in our church, what would that be? Jesus, the Savior. So it will be my prayer for you and for me and for our church that we have this true revival, meaning that we have the true sense of God's heart. We be together with God. So that we can have sense, awareness, of His pain. His glory. His glory will be mine. John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer. 
glorifying you so that I can glorify you. That unity with God. A sense of oneness with God. I think that's the true Bible day today. So as the world shapes the church, it shapes us. You know, as the world just hardens God's heart, it just hardens our, just hardens our hearts. Because Jesus is the one that we need. He's the one who turns and sees you. Because he cares about you. He loves you to the point of death on the cross. He's the one, one and only, who can pardon our sins and death. And Jesus is the only one who can give us everlasting life to those who believe in him and stay mental with him. And he's the one that promised, I will come again to judge the living and the dead and complete the kingdom work that I have started. He's the answer. So may God bless you and our church so that we can have this true revival. God, you know, when we pray, we pray for God. We pray for God's kingdom. We pray for God's glory so that the world may see the living God and the God will work something amazing into us and beating down the Goliath and, and glorify God and save his people. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's talk.